Thank you. Um, before we have the pleasure of hearing from Dr. Bonomi, we're going to have a brief introduction by Professor Cinzia Noble of the Department of French and Italian to explain to all of us what the relationship is with the Dante Alighieri Society of Siena. So. Dante Alighieri Society was founded in 1889 by a group of Italian scholars by initiative of the poet Giosuè Carducci, who received the 1906 uh, Nobel Prize for Literature. The Dante's main purpose is to promote the Italian language and culture around the world. It is run on, on a completely voluntary basis and has over 500 branches or chapters uh, of which 400 are scattered in Africa, the Americas, Europe, Asia, and Oceania. We work with the Siena chapter, whose president is Professor Luca Bonomi, and he's our guest. Um, I, uh, my presentation is very short, but it's a winning combination because we love working with Professor Bonomi and the Dante Alighieri in Siena. Okay, maybe it's not working. I use that? Okay. That's good. Okay. Um, uh, Siena is in the region of Tuscany, which is in the heart of Italy, and we make it, made it red so we can show it is in the heart of Italy. Um, maybe if I can put it here. You can do this way. How do you do it? Non vuole. No, faccio così. Okay, no, non faccio così. Ho trovato. Grazie. Ho trovato. Okay, it's uh, only 70 kilometers from Florence and 290 from Rome, and it's a beautiful, beautiful city on the hillside in in Tuscany. Very green, beautiful medieval city. Uh, the population is about 60,000 inhabitants uh, that live in the city of Siena. Uh, there are about 30,000 students uh, at the University of Siena. My father graduated in medicine many years ago at that university, and uh, we didn't even count the foreigners. It's impossible to count them. And uh, about 180,000 people work in Siena but live in the surrounding area. Uh, with our contribution uh, uh, cooperation, we have three entities that work with us. Of course, the first one is the hosting institution, which is the Dante Alighieri, and they take care of issues relating to administrative, logistics, academic, and advisement for the students. So, you see, they have the longest list. Without them, we would be dead. Uh, the academic department, which is us, uh, the faculty of the French and Italian uh, uh, department, we take care of academic and advisement of students. And last but not least, it's a Kennedy Center. Um, Aaron Rose and his staff uh, take care of uh, administrative and logistics uh, and communication with uh, uh, Dante Alighieri. And uh, thank, thanks to them, they put basically at first in contact us with Dante Alighieri. That's how we started our cooperation with them. Um, uh, how did we do it? At first, uh, we, we, I, I found out about the Dante Alighieri, so we organized a trip there. I was on another study abroad program there, and then I went and visited with Professor Bonomi, and I was in, immediately impressed, so I came home and decided to organize, uh, start organizing programs with them and working with them. Um, we service a, a, very, a very broad um, 
you know, number of uh, majors from civil engineering to French, Italian, uh, pre-medical, English, communication, neuroscience, you name it. Uh, we've had internships in Siena and students uh, from those majors and this is, these are just some of them, not all of them. Um, we have three major programs that we have uh, um, in collaboration with Siena and uh, the first one is the Italian language study abroad which is usually during spring term. It's a departmental uh, program through the Italian section and usually one or two of our faculty members accompany the students. Uh, and then we have an Italy general education program which is a uh, university-wide, not worldwide, a university-wide uh, program and professors from uh, different departments and uh, colleges take students there. And then the internships uh, uh, in Italy um, for all majors and uh, uh, all year round. I will focus specifically on the first and the last, the language study, uh, the language study abroad and the internship because that's what relate more closely to what we do in our department. Um, we, uh, for uh, uh, study abroad, uh, usually we, we go uh, to both Rome and Siena. We stay probably a week or ten days in Rome, and then we move to Siena. And in the first four, four weeks, we, we teach uh, uh, either a language or a culture class. And then for the remainder of the time, four weeks, uh, the students do the internship. So the study abroad is half and half. And uh, I love especially the cooking class that the Dante Ligieri offers us, and they have a beautiful beautiful facilities, so I, you'll see a couple of pictures of that because that's my favorite uh, aspect of our program. Um, for study abroad, the, the students need to have as a prerequisite Italian 102 and a preparation course that's usually taught by an Italian faculty member on the second block of winter semester and prepares the students for, for the program. Um, uh, for the internship, uh, students can go for either 12 weeks or uh, 8 weeks. Um, if they go for 12 weeks, they have two uh, weeks of uh, um, language-specific instruction at the Dante Ligieri, and then uh, uh, 10 weeks of internship. If they go for a, uh, just a term, they do one week of language-specific and seven weeks internship. So it's a little short program, but uh, it's also a wonderful opportunity for our students. Uh, for the internships, our prerequisites are a little higher. Uh, it's Italian 201, and of course the same prep course where we put together sometimes both the study abroad the participants and the internships, you know, students who go for the internships. Uh, we have, again, one uh, picture of the cooking class that the Dante Ligieri offers there, but in the past we've offered a wide variety of internships and these are not all of them, but they span from hospitality, chemical lab, medical lab, social work, administrative support, cosmetology, English teaching, law, art administration, photography, education, architecture, culinary arts, of course, business, finance, pre-med, physical therapy, um, photography, you know, we, we've done lots, lots of fields. Uh, housing, uh, we're very lucky that the Dante Ligieri um, finds housing for us. Students can live either in uh, uh, single room or double rooms and uh, either with, uh, in an apartment or with a host family. Uh, what do I do as a faculty member? I interview the applicants. I teach the cross-cultural cross preparation course, or one of my colleagues does, depending on the <coughs> year or the semester. And uh, we offer a variety of classes. I've grouped here together classes that are offered uh, either for internship or, or study abroad. So it's, uh, students do not take all these classes. They, they have a choice among all these classes. Uh, and uh, our classes are very academically oriented. It's not just a trip abroad. It's, a, it's an academic course that, that we teach there. Now, what does the Dante do for us? Um, they uh, find and place our students in different internships that we, as we have seen, and they uh, choose the hosting companies and institutions according to how reliable they are, how available they are, if they're willing to share the expertise, they have to be excited about that, so our students have a positive experience, and if this company need help. Um, they are accredited by the regional government of Italy and they're inspected annually. They have a certification and they also ensure our students against any liability that may occur during, uh, during an internship. So, I mean, something that we did not have before and the, uh, Dante Ligieri is able to, to offer to us and to our students. 
um, uh, when our interns come, they inform the National Job Center and the Trade Union Office, and our students are registered there, so it's totally official and legal. They establish a written agreement uh, or contract uh, with the companies uh, we work with, and they also participate in the evaluation process during, uh, before, during, and after the, the actual internship. Um, they inform the students about their placement. They assign an internal and external tutor to the student, an internal which is a, a faculty member from the Dante Alighieri, and the external is the person who is their supervisor uh, in the actual company where the students are placed. And uh, three days before the internship, Professor Bonobio or somebody from his staff personally accompanies um, uh, he, the, the students to, to the different companies and introduce them to their supervisor. So it's a very on a personal basis and not threatening and the students are really, really uh, comfortable in moving on to, to this new environment. Uh, the most important institutions that they have, uh, they work with and we are working with, they have um, an agreement, an official agreement with the mayor of the city of Siena and uh, their museums, there are five museums that are under the management of, of the city um, government where the students work in, an, in a variety, they're rotated in a variety of tasks from the ticket office to the bookshop to tour guides, you know, anything that they need, they have a variety of uh, tasks to perform. Uh, another important institution we work with, it's for our social work, it's Istituto della Misericordia, and uh, uh, it was founded in 1250, so it's pretty reliable, uh, and uh, um, uh, they are a social institution that gives assistance uh, uh, to the poor, the young and elderly with disabilities, immigrants, and they also run ambulances, and the student, our students have worked in, in a number of these uh, this tasks with, uh, with the Misericordia. Other important institutions is the University of Siena, especially for the medical internships, both in the lab and the research lab and uh, uh, shadowing uh, surgeons in, uh, in the OR. Um, our students do not perform surgery yet. Uh, and, uh, and so they, uh, we work with the University of Siena um, in, this, in this area. Other important companies that we worked with, with is uh, architect studios, accounting offices, physiotherapist, uh, graphic design companies, uh, and so on, uh, um, even uh, farmers, you know, olive oil and agricultural production, in teaching English as a second language in the public school, in the Liceo Scientifico, the university hospital, and so on. Um, because of uh, our association with the Dante Alighieri School and Professor Bonomi specifically, in just the past three years, we have had over uh, 130 students who have gone to Siena in any of those three programs that I told you about. Professor Bonomi and his staff has off have offered us the warmth of the Italian heart combined with a perfect and highly academic organization, and we are deeply, deeply thankful to them for that. Thank you. Thank you, Cinzia, for your words. They're all true. Um, I would just like to turn a few moments over to uh, Professor Cory Cropper, the department chair of uh, the Department of French and Italian, for a brief presentation. Well, you know that we have a pretty small Italian section. We only have three full-time faculty members, and I think you would agree with me that they all do a great job. I know mo many of you are students here and have had classes from them. And Cinzia and Ilona and Rod, they put in a lot of hours to make the program click. And a lot of you, uh, I recognize the student instructors have, that helped now or have helped in the past teach in our program, and I want to thank you. But we, of course, it was such a small group, we can't do it without some help. And uh, Professor Bonomi has been a big help in helping place all, so many students. A lot of you have gone through this program. And we want to say thank you as uh, chair of the department. I just want to. Uh, Professor Bonomi, come up here. I have a little uh, plaque of appreciation and, and uh, something to, to recognize our partnership between uh, Brigham Young University and the Societa Dante Alighieri. Did I do okay? <laughs> French professors trying to uh, get their way through Italian. Anyway, 
I want to present Thank this you. to you on behalf of the department Thank and the you. university, and I, and I appreciate the work Thank you're you doing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. Let me just uh, a, little, a little present from uh, Italy. I'm done uh, with Thank you, Italy. But uh, we didn't know what um, to bring for state, to stay for. Um, uh, certified our uh, deep gratitude for the BYU and for the department. So being uh, as a, a, an old uh, uh, country with uh, a little bit of a tradition in historical <laughs> things and uh, being a BYU um, a religious institution with especially uh, very good in, uh, in uh, singing. We thought, I heard a lot of uh, times, uh, um, our students, I mean BYU students at Dante Alighieri sing in the, even in the streets and it was uh, always amazing. We have uh, uh, brought on behalf of uh, Dr. Sonia Di Centa, who is our principal, the founding member of the school, and all the teaching, the, the administrative uh, staff, there's a little present uh, to, to you for the department. Thank you. Wow. Wow. Uh, I want Chintzia to come and sing this for us. <laughs> no chance. Well, maybe Sandy Talbot. I know that she has a wonderful voice. Sandy. And this is what he, it is. Um, so Chintzia translated for me because I wasn't able to do it. It's uh, an original parchment with handwritten Gregorian music executed in central it Italy from the 16th century. Wow. So, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I just want to, um, on behalf of the Kennedy Center, uh, thank Professor Bonomi personally. Um, we've been friends for probably 10 years in developing such programs, and it's been a pleasure for me as well. So, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, you can stand right here as I introduce our uh, prestigious guest today. In addition to his work as the president of the Societa Dante Alighieri of Siena, Bonomi is a scholar of opera with a degree of music and theater from the University of Rome, La Sapienza. He has held conferences on the history of Italian opera with particular focus on the pre-romantic, romantic, and verista periods. He teaches courses in Italian language, culture, opera, the history of Italian cinema, and linguistic training for singers of the opera companies of Florence and Siena. Bonomi has recently been appointed as the Director of Cultural Affairs of the Torre Contrada <laughs> of Siena, and Bonomi serves as the on-site coordinator for BYU's study abroad programs and internships in Siena. Please help me in welcoming Professor Bonomi. I press TV. Oh, here you go. <coughs> so, <coughs> a special thank to everybody here. Um, for me, it's a pleasure to come back, so I'm a little bit moved right now, so you have to leave me some minutes for recovering, because uh, <laughs> it's always a pleasure to have such a good friends we work with, and uh, special thanks to the department again, and to the Kennedy Center, and Rose, Rose, uh, they do a great, uh, a great job. Now, I'm particularly mad because, uh, um, I, first of all, I'm talking in English without, uh, without reading, so I do apologize for my mistake and for my bad pronunciation, but uh, I hope you find this like a little sign of respect for your city, for your country, and for your culture and for your language. And first of all, and the second reason why I'm mad is because I want to speak 
speak about uh, such a, a big, important opera like Rigoletto in uh, um, give me uh, around one hour because otherwise I will not end. <laughs> um, so my, you have to keep this not like a lecture. I hope you you find this like a, for me it's like a family reunion. So uh, you have uh, you can stop any time for with more uh, for uh, trying to understand what I'm telling you and uh, and uh, for if you have any questions just please uh, interrupt me. But this is the spirit. So it's not very very, very formal. The, um, this guy, Giuseppe Verdi, was born in Roncole di Busseto in 1813 and died in Milan in 1901, is considered the father of the romantic melodrama in, in the history of opera. He um, had a I do not want to give you more, a lot of details about uh, his uh, biography, but uh, he was born in a countryside in a very poor family. They didn't, uh, uh, they wasn't, uh, they weren't even uh, uh, be um, uh, farmers. They had a little shop in uh, in this uh, little village. No musical studies, uh, and no one studied uh, music. He started to study by, by himself, and uh, this is his uh, home where he was born. And uh, in, um, with the years, uh, he became the most important composer of opera in, uh, in, uh, in Italy and um, one of the two most important uh, composers. One is a German, so I don't want to take him, <laughs> him in consideration. <laughs> but uh, for the, the, with the 19th uh, century. Um, he had a very strange life at the beginning with a lot of problems. He didn't have money, he applied for uh, to, to study music in the, in the School of Music of Conservatory of Milan. They didn't accept that him with the statement, you will never become a musician. <laughs> That's the reason why, if you sometimes you fail an exam, think about him, <laughs> <laughs> because, and then he was also very hard. Uh, he had a very bad car, um, attitude. So when he became famous, Milan wanted to give to make a statue in the school of music of him, and he said, "No, you didn't accept me uh, when I was young. You will never have my statue." inside. <laughs> The first uh, um, part of, uh, of, uh, her li of uh, his life was very, very, uh, with a lot of troubles. Uh, he went uh, to Milan with uh, his wife and uh, two kids, and in two years uh, he lost uh, all uh, his uh, family. He, he had, but he had at one point a wonderful career, and he became rich, and this this is the villa that uh, he bought. He was very concrete. He didn't want to, to invest money in banks. He wanted uh, farm uh, houses, you know, because he came from this uh, background. And uh, this is uh, his uh, first wife, uh, and uh, this is, he traveled also a lot. He went to Russia, he went to, to Paris a lot of time. His uh, second wife was a very famous and beautiful um, opera singer, so very well uh, educated, and uh, she was very, very important for uh, his career as well. And um, this is uh, his last photo that is original, and this is uh, uh, the photo of uh, his funeral. 
think about that when he was uh, going to die three months before, all of the streets in Milan uh, around his uh, his apartment was covered with clothes because uh, um, people didn't want to disturb him. So he is still not only the most famous opera composers, but uh, very loved by by Italian. And we will see, maybe talking about Rigoletto, why he is so, so loved. After um, the first two operas, he composed in 1842 the Nabucodonosor. Mm? You have to think, I can anticipate, that he said he had true, uh, three loves. The Bible, and this for a Catholic is not so common because uh, Catholics do not read very much the, the Bible. The, um, the theater, and particularly Shakespeare, and the novels. And um, we will not talk about all the operas, but what I would like to point out to you is you see underline the authors from which he um, took the ideas of the opera. So if you, ha if you give a little, uh, a little uh, uh, if we shortly read, we see that Victor Hugo with Hernani, Byron's with I Due Foscoli, uh, Schiller's with Giovanna d'Arco, Voltaire, <coughs> Zacharias Werner, Shakespeare with uh, Macbeth, um, Byron again with Il Corsaro, Luisa Miller from Schiller, um, Rigoletto from Victor Hugo, Il Trovatore by Antonio Mart uh, Garcia Gutierrez, La Treviata Alexandre Dumas Fille. <coughs> Shortly, the all most of the novel, with the, most of the, his uh, operas, with the exception of uh, Shakespeare theater, came from authors uh, contemporary of him, mm -hmm. hmm? Byron, Schiller, Victor Hugo, and not Italians, mm -hmm. French, English, uh, German. So he, may, he had this knowledge of the, what we call the European Romanticism. That is it's impressive because most of these operas were translated or by his wife, who was very well educated, she knew a lot of, uh, of uh, foreign languages, or by himself, like for French. You have, uh, and this is a little discretion of, uh, for Rigoletto, but we have the impression sometimes, especially for the musicians, that musicians are not so into the history of art. They are not so much into the philosophy, the, the art, the literature. This is not true at all. I can give you another example, and he is not Italian, but Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. And if you have uh, heard from him, you think that the, the music comes directly from heaven uh, to, to him. He is a source of music. But in his private library when he died, they found books by Immanuel Kant, by Hegel, by Marx, by a lot of philosophers who were very, very important. So this means that he was able and was curious to understand what was going on in, that, in his age. And it's exactly what Verdi made. 
in his career. He was not so theoretical comparing to Wagner, but he was practical. And if it's true that, especially at the beginning, his um, skills in music were not as the Wagner's one, who was the representative of the symphonism, of the German symphonism, but it's also true that he was very was a man of stage. He was working together with the authors of the librettos and together with the uh, with the opera singers and the actors, and he knew very well this system, what was appealing for him uh, and for the audience. If you have the chance to see uh, the some librettos of their decent draft. Um, by Maria Piave or Boito that uh, they submitted to him, you find uh, like a boring repetition. No, it's too long. Audience will be exhausted because he has the sense of the rhythm, of the uh, of the plot, of the climax and then the relaxation of the feeling so and this is comparing to to Wagner is completely different if we see in three years from 1850 to 1853 um, Verdi composed uh, these uh, three operas, Rigoletto, Trovatore e La Traviata. And uh, this is uh, the so-called uh, popular trilogy. So Wagner has uh, the tetralogy, but uh, he is a German, we have just the trilogy. <laughs> but comparing to Wagner, he didn't have uh, this idea to make um, like v uh, Wagner a tetralogy. So it just came that it just happened that he composed these three opera, the operas very, very closely. And we can say that these three operas are one of the most important uh, trilogy in the history of, uh, of uh, lyric uh, opera. He had, uh, he um, saw the drama uh, Le Roi Samuse by Victor Hugo. Um, he, he read the, 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 the drama in French. He uh, had this idea to do an opera and the so called Rigoletto. He had a lot of troubles for the censorship because uh, at that uh, time uh, Venice was under the Austrian uh, government and we are talking about someone, uh, you maybe you have read a little bit of the synopsis you, you, we are talking about uh, someone who wants to kill a king hmm? he didn't uh, so it, it was uh, no, not appropriate for the, for the time and the king is very also is a very bad uh, character so he had, um, he said, well, I can anticipate the story, and we are in around the Renaissance era, known in the contemporary era. We can move to a smaller city, Mantua, okay. We can, um, he's not anymore a king, the bad character, he's a duke. Okay, no problem. What he didn't want to avoid is the, if I'm cor correct me if I'm wrong, if I do a mistake, the hump. Hmm? Because he didn't want that Rigoletto didn't have the hump. We will see why, because this is a very important point in the plot of Rigoletto. So, at one point, at the end, he was able to uh, to put in on scene uh, this uh, this drama that became immediately very very popular. So my intention is that we see 
some scenes of course we cannot see uh, the all the all uh, the all opera but just some scenes and you will be so kind to leave me the time for uh, checking the scenes uh, the scenes that I want to talk uh, to you about this is an edition that is not on stage with a movie and you can find here the the opera singers is to be honest with you, it's not my best edition, but it was broken during the trip to US, my, my DVD. So uh, this is thanks for the BYU uh, library, I can have this, otherwise I could perform uh, <laughs> the... And I can do Rigoletto. Maybe I can do maybe um, the Duke of Mantua, but uh, the problem for me was the Gilda. That is, uh, <laughs> it's very impossible for me to perform. So we have uh, wonderful voices here. Mm, uh, it's a very good uh, edition, but it's not my preferite because it's not on stage. It's, a li it's like a movie, so we lose a little bit of the effect. So we are in the... Now, I hate machines, <laughs> but I will try to... I have a, a fake um, hump uh, here, so I can <laughs> always put. So, who is uh, the Duke of Mantova? The Duke of Mantova is a very, very bad. Uh, he's a naughty boy. He is uh, a uh, someone with a lot of power, who. Uh, loves women and being Italian this reminds me someone else that is, we are recorded <laughs> we can't say his name but uh, it's, uh, we have some, uh, some good examples uh, right now in Italy um, <laughs> of the Rigoletto's uh, <laughs> of Rigoletto's stuff <laughs> So, uh, during uh, he starts saying uh, how much he loves women, that uh, uh, he loves all women. So he is a, is a uh, sex, what you say now in US, maybe sexual addicted, something like that. It's like <laughs> Mel Gibson, I know that he was. So, someone like that. And he, um, he uh, is... Uh, uh, he is giving a party with, uh, with uh, his friends at one point and he has this fool, oh? this buffone, this uh, um, horrible man with this hump that he uses not only for his enjoyment but also because he helps the Duke in doing uh, a lot of love affairs. Mm? Uh, when he, uh, at one point, um, a man, a father, uh, uh, Conte Monterone, comes into the, the, the party and he is uh, uh, very, very upset because uh, uh, her, uh, the Duke um, had a sexual relationship with uh, his daughter. Mm? The Rigoletto jokes with him. He says, well, but uh, um, we are the Duke and you have to, 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 to do what we say. And he starts with the courts. The subtitle of Rigoletto is the courts. Because Monterone, that is like, I don't know if you are familiar with Don, uh, Don Giovanni by Mozart, is like the commendatore, uh, he says you will be punished for this. So we see this, uh, this uh, moment, I need...
Just one minute, I'm sorry, but I have to <coughs> to keep. Sorry. But uh, I didn't have time at the affects him so much because of the reason reason why he is affected so he is impressed and, uh, he feels bad about it and we will uh, have during all the old opera this this phrase that you will uh, uh, you will listen in, in one minute quel vecchio male di me and this re is the whole opera during the whole opera until the end she he has this nightmare now he is going to his uh, his uh, home and he is alone in Mantua in the dark and the music you will see is very very strange is uh, something that uh, without any description is not narrative the music he meets with someone and at the beginning he thinks he is someone who asked him for the money he is not he is Sparafucile and he is a killer a professional killer 
in this sense we are in a pulp fiction movie. <laughs> and when he introduced himself, I say, well, I'm a killer, you will see, I'm a killer, and how it's possible to pay 50 at the beginning and 50% when, when I have done the, how do you use, how, uh, how do you, uh, how are you able to, to attract the man uh, you want to kill, because I have a daughter, he has a system, he has a company of a killer, and he is a very, is a black humor, but um, very, um, and in this case, very well sung, because he's one of the most famous buses, uh, one of the most famous sparafucile. Um, well, we will see this part and then I will interrupt.
Now it starts uh, one of the um, most important part of the opera because uh, he he has just uh, he has just been courted. He meets with this man who is a killer. He starts a process of autoanalysis. And he is alone and start to think about him. And he say, well, the killer has the, the how do you say, pugnale, I know, the dogger, right? Yeah, the dogger. But I have my tongue. Uh, but we both kill people. And at one point, he says something very, very important. Think about that in 19th century, and, uh, mm, and even over, uh, those people with this kind of problems were signed by God. So it means again that God didn't want them. But uh, he says, man, and it means human society, you have made me a monster. So it's, it, this is very important if we think that we are 1850. Uh, someone who says something like that. And then he will talk against the courtiers, those people around the Duke.
So the, you see how the orchestra at one point smiles mm-hmm. when he thinks to the only treasure he has, his daughter. And the love, the kind of relationship between him and his daughter, Gilda, is very particular. He says, you are fruit of the only poor human being who loved me. And unfortunately, she died. But uh, at one point, uh, Gilda asks uh, him, who you are, because uh, um, he, she just moved to Mantua so a few days before. So sh- she doesn't know him. She doesn't even uh, know his name. And uh, uh, you will see what she answers, are two minutes, but uh, feel the intensity of uh, this uh, love for her. One minute or two. my country and my home. This kind of relationship reminds me, and this is not my opinion, is what the criticists say, the kind of relationship between King Lear and Cornelia. It's, it's in that period Verdi was thinking to compose a King Lear for as an opera. And if you think also the relationship between the fool in King Lear and the Rigoletto, you have the idea that King Lear was a minor for him. Uh, he kept a lot of themes from King Lear and put in, uh, in uh, Rigoletto. 
coming back to the to the start of the plot, uh, the the courtiers uh, keep Gilda uh, uh, because they think she is uh, she is uh, Rigoletto's lover, and uh, she they want to revenge. And the Rigoletto is desperate, and he goes to the to the Duke's palace for finding, trying to find her. Now are seven minutes, but in seven minutes you have three completely uh, different uh, aspects of uh, his uh, behavior. At the beginning he pretends uh, not to say anything and you will say he laugh but is a very bitter laugh. So la da, la da, la da and the, the orchestra seems to support him in this fake scene. Then he is completely mad, cortigiani vil razza dannata, and the, 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 the courts on the courtiers. But at the end, he realizes what, uh, what, uh, what happened, and he begs, beg the people, give me back my tracer, give me back my daughter. And at one point he says, you see, I'm crying. At the beginning he said, the only thing that I can do is the tears. I can't cry like all the human beings. But at the end he shows the people that he is able also to cry. Because uh, we have a... well, we will see after. Hey, 
the process. I don't know how to stop. Sorry, okay. So the 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 process started with the health analysis. Now is the knowledge of the pain. And in the redemption, in the romanticism, uh, European romanticism, there was this concept of the redemption. Like Jesus Christ, with, her, with his uh, uh, death, was able to redeem everybody, all the human beings. The same with a, 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 a person who suffers a real strong pain and he becomes a hero. If you think about Traviata, she is a prostitute, but at the end, because she was able to sacrifice herself, he uh, will sing before her death, I will go to the angels and I will pray with you, and everybody believes her, because uh, her sacrifice was uh, so strong uh, that he becomes, uh, she becomes an hero. It's uh, the same process of Rigoletto. She is uh, the, he is uh, the, uh, the, the, the worst human being in the world. He has also signed by God with the, with the hump. But uh, uh, with his sufferance, uh, he can become a hero. And in fact, when uh, after just a few minutes later, when uh, Gilda says uh, who, him uh, the truth and what happened, he sings this uh, cabaletta, si vendetta. The words were written uh, by Verdi, we are sure about it. But Verdi writes, uh, a very important notes. He, at the beginning, in a letter he sends to Piave, Verdi was a, a very was a writer, was a very um, a heavy writer. He wrote a lot of letters also to his uh, wife, who was uh, one room far away from <laughs> from him. He wrote <laughs> letters for. Uh, we are lucky for this, but uh, he writes at that point when Rigolet is singing this uh, cabaletta, it seems like he lost his uh, hump. Because uh, now we understand why he wanted uh, the, the, he had the hump. Because this was a sign how uh, worst he was, how bad he was. But at that point, he seems that he becomes a hero. See how they do this.
so he Gilda's sin is that she loves him and she doesn't want to renounce to him to the duke I will we will not be able to 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 see a very important uh, the quartet uh, that is uh, very important but during which uh, Gilda acknowledged the betrayed of uh, of uh, the duke but still at the end she decides to sacrifice himself herself uh, saving uh, his life Rigoletto who through Sparafucile, uh, was uh, organizing uh, the, the, kill, the, the death of the Duke, thinks that um, he has the body of the Duke, but in fact he, has, he finds the body of his, uh, of his daughter dying. And we will see just a few minutes of the death of Gilda, and so we will and with a few other consideration. Yes. 
Just uh, this is a personal notice. Maybe it's wrong, so keep with uh, attention what I'm, I'm telling you. It's just a proposal. Usually, at the end of the opera, we know exactly what the characters uh, will will uh, do in the future. So we know that Alfredo will marry and he will be happy and Traviata of course dies on scenes. We know that uh, Simon Boccanegra, I watched a few days ago, uh, he dies but uh, they marry, they will, uh, one of them will become a Doge of Genoa. In Rigoletto we do not have a dot at the end for him. And we can figure out how will he will be going around in the countryside, desperate for his tracer, for what happened to him, and hating uh, all the people who, um, who killed her daughter, his daughter. Rigoletto was uh, um, immediately a big success. Everyone loved Rigoletto since the beginning. It was not like that for all the Verdi's opera. And the most uh, important example in this sense was Traviata, that was a completely a disaster, was a flop. After eight evenings, they had to stop with the performances. Um, this is uh, why the uh, this is because uh, the um, the people um, were very um, the, the 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 plot had a very appealing uh, um, it was a very appealing plot for the for the audience with a noir history, but uh, think about uh, how many messages. Uh, behind this story, we uh, Verdi was able to bring to the audience courtiers are bastard. Power is a corruption of the uh, of the good values uh, for the, the 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 what happened to Gilda. The um, the monster man with this sign of God, just the society makes them a monster. So these kind of messages were absorbed immediately by the audience. And this is why, according to me, if we do a course in, uh, in um, history of the 19th and 20th century, we can't avoid 
to teach our students about the opera. Because Verdi, with Puccini, with Wagner for the German culture, with Mozart for, uh, for the 18th century, but they were so popular and they were able to give messages uh, that were not so related to the music, but maybe they built a new conscience of the, of the people of that age. I don't know if you have any question. You were so brave to resist until the end. <laughs> So you will, uh, you should. Um, I should give you a prize for this. Uh, I do thank you very much for your for your attention, and thank you again all of the BYU. I uh, I have a I would have a list of people to mention, but all of you because you are uh, uh, one of my best families in uh, in uh, US. So. I do thank you for your always warm uh, welcome. Thank you. We'd like to thank you once again, Luca, for this wonderful presentation. Do we have any questions um, before we part today? It looks like we have Please. a few. Luca, just uh, referring to what you said last, what was the aristocracy's reaction to was um, was uh, this is a very interesting, uh, qu very clever question. Um, the aristocracy um, was divided in two kinds of aristocracy. So those who were more liberal and more, um, uh, they wanted to have a unified nation. Italy, and they didn't like the Austrian power in Italy and the Austrian presence in Italy. And they were very happy because they didn't represent the bad power. But they were like Cavour and other people. <coughs> They, Catania, they represented the leadership of a new generation, of a new society. Those who were linked to the uh, very uh, old fashion, uh, restored uh, aristocracy, uh, think about uh, Naples, uh, the kingdom of Naples, or uh, the, those who were in favor of the Austrian Hungarian government, they, of course, uh, they didn't like. This was one of the reasons why the Austrian censorship didn't want to put uh, that very put on scenes. And they used uh, some tricks. Uh, they didn't uh, bring all of the librettos. So the poor Piave was going up and down from Venice to Buceto because Verdi didn't want to move until he had the good uh, the, appro the approval. So he had to change some words, change some parts, didn't uh, submit all of the, uh, the librettos but uh, just uh, resume like a, a skin. So, um, because that I understood immediately that it was uh, dangerous. Mm -hmm. What are your favorite versions? Favorite My favorite version is a, a very old one and it's very dark, but from a vocal point of view is one of the best. It is with uh, uh, Leonucci. Uh, Alfredo Kraus e Luciana Serra, Il Reggio di Parma, 1987. And unfortunately, um, it's very, very dark uh, because it was not recorded according to the new uh, with the new tools. Uh, there is another nice version that was broken during my trip. Um, is uh, was recorded in uh, Arena di Verona in 2001 with Leonucci and Ivna Mula. 
and Leo Nucci is one of the most famous uh, uh, Rigoletto in the history of, uh, of um, the, 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 the performing arts, the recent performing arts. Uh, this one is, is, is uh, the Arena di Verona version in 2001. And he also they uh, make a beast that is uh, very rare right now, especially in Italy. They made a beast with the uh, another time the uh, cabaletta, the si vendetta. Mm, they are very nice. And Yves Namula is a new, is a young um, soprano, but very very um, good for this rule, the rule of Gilda. We of course. We couldn't, uh, we couldn't hear most of the of the opera, but the rule of Gilda, from a vocal point of view, is uh, devastating the the opera singers because uh, they have to use all the techniques of the so-called bel canto. Think about uh, um, caro nome, uh, caro nome, che il mio. But together with already with the lyric and the dramatic um, nuance of the of the voice, this will be confirmed two years later with Traviata. Traviata, according to me, the, the last uh, part of the first act is the last example of the bel canto. And from that generation, from that point on, we will assist to the to the uh, to a new uh, kind of um, soprano. Is the Verdi sopranos? And the Verdi sopranos and the Verdi uh, um, tenors, uh, not the Duke, because the Duke is is singing according to the old tradition, but the um, the Verdi sopra the tenors in Don Carlos or in uh, Simon Boccanegra or in Otello, or, they have a special color, the voice. In fact, Pavarotti couldn't perform in that op. He did, but uh, he wasn't the best tenor in that kind of rules, because they need a special, a special voice. The voice that we um, have, uh, the, the, the most important example in this sense is Placido Domingo, who is the Verdian tenor. Mm. Any other questions? Please. Uh, I'm interested in the link you made to King Lear. Yeah. Um, and uh, Freddie's interest in Shakespeare. And it's interesting, it, in the 19th century, King Lear was very rarely presented in England because um, Victorians found the death of Cordelia unbearable to yeah. watch on stage. Yeah. And they thought it unjust and unfair that so good a character yeah. Rigoletto is a popular success. Yes, you know that this is something that I like to say, especially when there are French professors. I don't know if they are. But Victor Hugo, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry, but Victor Hugo went to see the, uh, the Rigoletto and he wrote. My Le Roi Samus, it's, it's better than Rigoletto. But in 100 years, everybody will see and see in Rigoletto, and nobody will see Le Roi Samus. And in this sense, Victor Hugo was very, very clever, because he f saw immediately that the plot, comparing to the Le Roi Samus, was uh, um, well, uh, better structured, maybe, and then the music, because Victor Hugo didn't have the music for Le Roi Samus. But it's true what you say, and it's also true that in that age, there were um, a new tradition in, uh, in the Italian theater,
the Italian theater doesn't have uh, a so long tradition, it doesn't have uh, such a, a long tradition uh, because, first of all, because it was uh, made uh, on stage without writing uh, the text, and then because of the opera, because of the opera took the place of the drama of the but at that time there was a rediscover of Shakespeare and of course they translated Shakespeare but they were very important actors during the 19th century who performed in Italy Shakespearean Shakespearean plays and it was a very until the beginning beginning of the uh, 20th century. And, and uh, Verdi loves Shakespeare because uh, he is a man of the theatre. So he understands how clever Shakespeare is in, uh, in uh, representing the different characters and in especially in, uh, he says, he writes this, the climax up and down in Shakespeare, he is a, a very important lesson for, for him. Any other question? Okay, well, thank you so, again. So, I much. thank you again. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And please, please do come up and, and uh, say hello to Professor Bonomi while we still have him. His departure is tomorrow morning. So, thank you again for coming. Thank you.